We've talked a lot about Bill Sharman on this podcast. Legendary Boston Celtics shooting guard and a great coach who won titles in three leagues. Just a terrific motivator and teacher. He coached Los Angeles Stars to the ABA Finals in 1970. They were an underdog team, barely above 500, led by two unheralded rookies who would go on to make the ABA's all-time team and a group of solid but unspectacular journeymen. The Stars lost in 1970 to the Indiana Pacers, a budding powerhouse who would win three of the next four ABA championships, and Sherman was giving a speech to his players. He then laid his eyes on the one shining ray of hope the team, who would soon move to Salt Lake City, had for the next season. Zemo Beatty, a star NBA center who had signed with the Stars, but had to sit out a season much like Rick Barry before. Beatty tells the story in Terry Pluto's Indispensable Loose Balls. Quote, Something that always stuck with me happened when I was in the L.A. Stars dressing room after they were eliminated by Indiana in the finals. Bill Sharman talked to the team for a while, then looked at me and said, Next year, we're going to win it all with Zelmo. End quote. And they did. You are listening to Over and Back's Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s. Today's mystery is, what did Zelmo do for Utah? Hello and welcome to the Over and Back Classic NBA Podcast. I am Jason. Here with me to talk about the uh, Utah Stars is the great Curtis Harris of ProHoopsHistory.com. Curtis, welcome back to the program, sir. Hey, always good to be here, Jason. And um, so the... The Utah Stars, they actually started off in Anaheim as the Amigos for a season, the first year with the um, with the ABA. Then they moved to L.A. for two seasons and became the L.A. Stars, um, coached by Bill Sharman. The second year, the team made a surprise run to the 1970 ABA Finals despite having a you know relatively uh, uh, unknown cast, had two uh, rookies on that team, uh, Willie Wise and Mount Matt Calvin, who were among the uh, leaders in the team, Willie Wise would take an even bigger role for the team later on. And, um, and but unfortunately, things did not work out well in, in LA. But they were able to move to uh, Salt Lake City, where they helped establish a foothold for pro basketball. That even though the Stars ended up failing, would later pay dividends with the um, Utah Jazz. Um, what comes to mind first when you talk about the uh, Stars? Um, I. I think the stars were one of the three, uh, like truly, oh, I guess maybe, and now I'm thinking about it, maybe four or five two truly successful franchises at the ABA, but it seems like them along with the Pacers had the most rabid fan base. So you just think of, at least for myself, I think of just the supreme amount of support they had from the fans in Utah, even though people thought like, you know, it is Utah is a never really had a professional team there in any sport. Uh, but the fans really took to the team. They gave it a lot more support than they ever got in Los Angeles. So that's for me, that's the first thing I think of, just how supportive the, the state and the city was of the team right right, right from the get-go. Yeah, absolutely. And um, they had a... Um... Uh, they had three of the 11 best uh, SRS seasons in ABA history, uh, the, the fourth uh, in 1971 and 10th and 11th in 72 and 73. So they were, uh, you know, a pretty strong yeah. powerhouse team during that time. Um, they ran into the Pacers several times in the playoffs. So those two teams played uh, five seasons in a row in the uh, playoffs. So that was probably the only thing sort of keeping them from, you know, reaching kind of even a more memorable level was, you know, basically the, the Pacers won three championships in four seasons. Um, they, they really, the stars championship broke up a chance for the Pacers to, you know, to reach four finals in a row. So, uh, you know, they, they sort of, you know, fall a little bit under the shadow of that Pacers team, but they obviously were an, an excellent team. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, the fans, as I say, you know, really supported the team, but they were also supporting a really good team. So that, that always helps. Um, you know, and, and the, the next thing I think of beyond defense support is the fact they had a the good team, but also the fact that they had Zemo Beatty join the team. That's really, really elevated them to to really not just making a surprise finals run, but really making sustained runs year after year uh, being a finals team uh, was Zemo Beatty's addition. And also, uh you know, partway through the 71 season, they add Ron Boone, and that just really solidifies uh, their status as like a perennial contender in the ABA. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, they, they really were a you know a, a smartly built uh, team. Um, uh, Vince Borla was their um, was their general manager. He had been a he had been a player with the uh, Knicks and in the uh, in the fifties, I believe, uh, some of those finals teams. And uh, yes. and, and you know they were able to uh, start off with um, you know not not much coming from you know, with that last year in L.A. and coming into Utah and able to t- sort of turn that into some really good players. Um, Let's start with the 1970 uh, team. They uh, th- this team reached the finals of their last season in LA. Um, they were a 43 win team, sixth in the league, sixth in the league in SRS as well. So sort of middle of the pack regular season team. Uh, the second year with Bill Sharman, who was a uh, was of course a Celtic star. We've talked a lot about him before and some of his innovations in terms of fitness and in terms of. Um, uh, organization scouting reports of uh, f- game film uh, having players watch game film on TV as they were getting ready in the locker room figuring most people would watch it uh, and, and other innovations as well um, and, and he this was his he had, he had already coached in the ABL in the early 60s and then had coached the uh, Golden State Warrior with with uh, Rick Barry in the uh, 68 season after they had made the finals Um so, so what uh, stands out to you as far as Charmin coaching this team? I mean, yeah, like we've, we've talk, talked about him a lot before, uh, but I think you've hit upon a lot of it. It's just that, you know, he's, he had this attention to, you know, the detail, like where he would show the guys, you know, game film and photos, really get them to focus on, you know, I'm not just telling you what should happen, but I'm showing you what should happen. And that really, you know, anybody that's ever done any kind of teaching or something, something along those lines really knows that, you know, you can tell somebody about something or you can show them something and showing them what they ought to be doing is a lot more effective than simply just telling them uh, with, with, the, with the word, with the spoken word. So Charmin was innovative with that approach, but also players really did see him as a teacher. Uh, he was a guy that um, didn't yell at players uh, unnecessarily, didn't, you know, cuss them out unnecessarily. He would, you know, see what was going wrong and would point out to him like, Hey, you're like you know, you're you're capable of doing better than this. So why don't you just go ahead and do it? Like we know you're capable of doing that. Uh, so he was really a, like a motivator, making you know good substitutions at the right moments. He wasn't uh, you know a guy that would go on tirades and berate players. And I think that's why people who played for him really respected him and really enjoyed playing for him, even if even if he did have like those grueling practices. But you re- but you knew the, the practices were leading towards. Um, you know, not necessarily perfection, but like a, a high level of excellence on the court during games where, you know, you know, if we practice this for you know, a, a thousand hours this season, then you know you ought to be able to do it during the game. So I think that's all. So it was all building up to his philosophy of um, being really organized, being really prepared and really knowing what you should be able to do on a basketball court. Mm hmm. Yeah, and he also was known for having you know sort of a system of fines and rewards where you know he would fine guys for certain um, you know for, for you know, letting their man get by them or things like that that were happening on the court, but would also reward them if they you know made a good defensive play, figuring that you know, they could kind of incentivize that behavior uh, in the game. And and, and Zelmo talked about that um, in loose balls of just you know having it in mind that you know okay I want to block the shot or I want to you know pre- prevent this guy from getting the basket just to be able to, um, uh, you know, just, just even though the, the amount of money wasn't really that much, it was just sort of the idea of not wanting to be down or just, you know, it's sort of an extra little way of uh, motivating the uh, players, which, you know, was clever and interesting for the uh, time. So um, the the first year team led by um, a couple of rookies who uh, started there, uh, Willie Wise, who would uh, stay around with the team forever. He wasn't it, necessarily a huge role um, on this team would be a, a big role going forward. We'll talk about him more in just a few minutes, but I wanted to kind of get through, some, through a little bit of the other guys. Um, Mal Calvin, who was a future uh, four-time All-Star, I believe, was a really small but incredibly fast guard and um, – he was was known for his stamina and being a, a fan favorite, and just had a lot of desire. And was uh, one guy who really um, blossomed under Charmin. Uh, was encouraged by Charmin to keep a notebook. You know, seeing his opponent's tendencies to be able to, uh, uh, you know, figure out how to you know play them the next time, and you know, keeping things organized that way. Um, 
Other guys included uh, George Stone, was nicknamed Rocky, who was an epic three-point shooter with a 30-foot range, but was also a historically bad defender. Uh, Merv, the magician Jackson, who was uh, considered a very smooth and was a, uh, Willie Wise said was a great defensive player for uh, his size. And then they also had a, a, a mid-season acquisition of Craig Raymond, who was a 6'11 center, acquired from Pittsburgh and helped spark them to, uh, they were 16-22 and 22 at the time, and they finished two games above 500. So we're a, a, a much better second half of the season team. Uh, but going back to Willie Wise, he um, was a uh, three-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA, and two-time All-Defensive team. Uh, really considered the probably the best defensive forward in the league, especially once uh, Doug Moe started to age and then retire. Uh, and, and very well, paired very well with Azelmo Beatty, was able to work with him to kind of get open on screens and make that open uh, 15-footer. Um, what stands out to you with uh, Willie Wise? Uh, well, I'll say a little bit about Willie in just a moment, but I feel like Matt Calvin really was just an unbelievable uh, little small guard. And just real quick on him, like sure. he's one of those players. He's he's one of those players that you know he did play in the NBA after the merger, but he's one of those guys from the ABA that you really didn't see the best of him because you know by that point he was thirty years old and you know on, on, clearly on the decline by that point, but. Uh, he was an electric little guard. Um, just as you said, the the stamina, the motor, just incredibly fast, like a little water bug on the court. Uh, just just really good player. Played for a million different teams because the ABA was chaotic. But uh, wherever he played, he played excellently. So uh, that's a guy that that just deserves a lot more credit and just do for what he did in basketball. Uh, and, and you know, the same can be said for Willie Wise. Um, he also played in the NBA very briefly, but by that point, his knees were shot. Um, and, there, and there's a great quote that he had uh, that I found when I wrote a little article about him. And he was talking about how he was guarding uh, George Gervin. And he was like, you know, he wasn't, this is the thing with Willie Wise. You listen to interviews with him. And he's always going like, well, you know, I have this great ability, but I'm not trying to brag. But I have this great ability to do this, or the team was so successful, but I'm not trying to brag. But we're, we were such a great team. And so he was talking in his interview, and he's like, all right. It's like, well, I, wanted to, I was one of the best defenders in the ABA, you know, just trying to tell like it is, not trying to brag. But I, would, I could guard George Gervin, and Gervin could never get by me. He could, if he got in the post, he could shoot over me because he was taller, but he would never drive by me. But then he said, like, in the NBA, like in 1977 or 78, he was guarding George Gervin, and Gervin just blew right by him like he was standing still. And Willie Wise was like, that's the play that I knew. I didn't have it anymore. Like, if George Gervin could just blow by me like I'm standing still, I, I don't have it anymore. My knees are completely gone. Yeah. So with him, that defensive mentality that he had was just so supreme. Like, he was a fast guy, about 6'6", uh, could guard any small forward in the league, uh, from Julius Irvin to George Gervin to Roger Brown. Uh, he, he would take them all on with, with, you know, gusto with glee. Like he felt that was his job to go take those guys on, but also was a really good offensive player. As you said, you know, working the pick and roll with Zemo Beatty, um, able to hit those mid range jump shots and was also really athletic, um, could really get up and dunk and work around guys that kind of way. Uh, so he was, I would say that, um, he was the linchpin of the stars franchise ultimately. Um, although some players, you know, crested higher than him at certain points uh, i think he was the that you know the linchpin like once he went then the whole franchise was pretty much put asunder uh without him they really weren't able to get to uh contend uh toward the mid 70s and they of course fell apart pretty quickly at that point so we interrupt this great podcast that you're listening to. My name is Kevin Rafuse. I'm Tim Tompkins. And I'm Justin Kuzart. And we host the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. We cover every team in the league and a bunch of really fun segments like random NBA player, Drive and Dougal, and hot takes from Reddit. So when you're done listening to this podcast, give us a search on iTunes or whatever podcast streaming app you're listening on. We're also at driveanddishpodcast.com. We are the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. And I, from what I've read, he also, you know, was sort of a, a guy who you cheered guys up and had a yep. lot of energy and, um, you know, had that contagious smile that would, you know, kind of um, make things lighthearted and, and, and make and just, you know, make, make the environment more better for his team and uh, and obviously led them to some great success. Um, so yeah, that's, and, it's, <laughs> and it's a team that they, they fed. I mean, we'll get to all the different personalities, but I'll just say right now, like they all like fed off each other. It was the right combination of personalities, I think, uh, which 
you know, we, we talk about it in basketball, but I think it should just be, you know, emphasized with this team that, you know, the, the core trio of personalities really fit well together, really uh, pushed each other higher and kept the team together, I, I think, really well. So in the uh, the West semis that year, they beat Dallas Chaparral's uh, four games to two. They they had Glenn Combs and Ron Boone, who would be tr- traded to the team the uh, next season. Uh, then they beat the Denver Rockets uh, four games to one, uh, led by Spencer Haywood, who had one game where he scored 59 points and another game where he uh, collected 30 rebounds and was incredibly dominant in the ABA for the one season he was there. But uh, they were not able to lead them to victory in this uh, series. And then in the finals, they uh, lost to the Pacers uh, four games to two. And uh, Roger Brown just went off in that series. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the greatest finals performances that most people don't know about. It was those last three games in that series were obscene. I think he averaged something like 44, 45 points over the last three games. Uh, just buried the stars. So, yes, absolutely. that was unfortunate for them. Yeah. So, and the, you know, the, the, the Pacers were really running on all cylinders at that point. And, you know, we're, we're just beginning their, uh, their own great run in the, um, in the ABA. So, uh, tough, tough, uh, tough matchup for the uh, stars but they would of course have Zemo Beatty the come in the next season now it was known to the team that uh, Zemo was going to be coming after that uh, season he had to sit out a year yep. a- after signing with the team because of the uh, reserve clause um and of, of course uh, Bill Sharman at the after the uh, the, the game is done he makes the uh, speech where he says next year we're going to win it all with Zemo um and Zelmo you know, t- t- talked about that as being s- something that really inspired him to want to play for Charmin and to, you know, be excited to come to the team. Now, uh, there was some reservation when he found out that the team was moving to Utah, however, which was not the, you know, not, not a place that was 99 percent white. And the Mormon church had um, had a history of discrimination against uh, African-Americans. But uh, Zelmo and his wife were toured the city and uh, decided that they would go forward. And, and it sort of opened up for other players to feel comfortable to play in there as well. Yeah, it- and Zemo's story is just so good uh, from a number of angles. Um, but, you know, I believe he was the second star player after Rick Barry to, you know, jump ship from the uh, NBA to the ABA. So he so he did it a season after Barry. Um, but, yeah, like he signed with the Los Angeles Stars, um, but then had to set out the season. So, you know, he's seeing what, what team is coming together. And as you told, you know, Charmin gives the speech, like we're going to win it all with Zemo next year. Um but what I find fascinating about his jump from the NBA to the ABA was uh, his recollection that, you know, he was getting paid about $40,000 a year by the Atlanta Hawks. And he was like, I'm worth more than $40,000. I want $100,000 a year. And the Hawks were like, oh, no, there's no way in hell we can pay that. And so he's like, all right, fine. The L.A. Stars have paid me the money I want. He signs with the Stars. The Hawks take him to court. And in court, uh, he said, you know, the, the Hawks said that he's worth $4 million to the franchise. And so it's just one of those moments where you're like, you know, this is kind of discrepancy the players had in their relations with the NBA at that point, where the NBA team says, oh, the player's worth $4 million, but we don't want to pay him $100,000 a year because he's not worth it to us in that regard. But in the value of the franchise, then somehow he becomes $4 million. Yeah. So I think that I think that really rubs them on the wrong way. And that probably added a little extra emphasis to him in his first season when he finally got to play in the ABA. Uh, to really prove, like, you know, he's worth every penny that he was getting paid by the Stars. And also, maybe just to rub it in a little bit more to the Hawks. Like, you know, you guys should have paid me the money I was worth uh, to begin with. Maybe you would have uh, maybe you would have made an NBA Finals, if, you know, if you had given me the money I deserved. Um, but he had a just a absolutely fantastic first season with the Utah Stars. Because uh, he was 31 years old by that point. So he's clearly, you know, on the backside of his career. Had been in the NBA for about 80 years at that point. Uh, but he averaged, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, maybe about 23 points, maybe about 15 rebounds a game, but also about 55% from the field that first season with Utah for the whole season. Uh, so he was just like a man on a mission, uh, was just a wrecking ball on the court because he was so strong. Uh, he was kind of a short for a center, but he was extremely strong, uh, gave Will Chamberlain fits in the NBA, and then gave the ABA centers real fits because uh, the picks and the elbows he would throw. Uh, but... Great teammate. 
So he was done all that for his teammates. So his teammates, he'd be a gentle giant, love them all, like pick pick them up. But the opponents, he messed with his teammates. Uh, he he would throw the picks and throw the elbow shivers uh, to, to help, help help out his teammates, make them make them better off. Mm-hmm. Um. So the move to Utah, uh, Bill Daniels, who was a cable TV pioneer, promised that Salt Lake would become the Green Bay of professional basketball. And as you mentioned uh, at the top of the show, they instantly had uh, a great deal of fan support. In fact, they had the um, I believe it was the biggest first year um, attendance for any NBA or ABA team in uh, in the league's history. So that's obviously a, a pretty impressive mark. Um by the way, you were almost exactly right on uh, Zelmo's uh, averages that season. It was 22.9 points, 15.7 rebounds, um, and uh, he finished first in the uh, league in field goal percentage and third in rebounding. So, tremendous season for him. And, and he had been, you know, more like a 16-12 and 12 type player in the NBA. You know, very good, but not, um, you know, necessarily among the elite centers. Um, but... He did say that a year off was sort of helpful to him. It, you know, it, it helped his, his knees, which are already achy, oh, yeah. rest, and you know, and it gave him some extra, um, gave him some extra oomph for that season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had some bad knees by that point. Um, so yeah, like that. Yeah, that year off probably did him good, did him well in the end. Uh, just to have the knees just rest up for a whole year. Um, and, and, and his NBA numbers were a little deflated because you know his first couple of years he was playing with uh, Bob Pettit and. The St. Louis slash Atlanta Hawks were just always stacked with with a good front court. So his numbers were a little depressed in the NBA, but I think in, when he went to the ABA, maybe the field goal percentage was a little was a little you know, a lot higher than it probably would have been back in the NBA. But I think uh, generally his production in the ABA would have been mirrored in the NBA if he had had you know just a year off like he would have had uh, or the year off that he did get uh, transfer into the ABA. Yeah, and the role that he took. On yeah, the stars. yeah, and the role he was able to play with the with the stars. Yeah. yeah. Um. So other key players who uh, on that team include uh, Red Robbins, who was called the uh, walking one iron. It was a uh, a very tall but skinny player, came from the New Orleans Buccaneers and was a, uh, averaged 12.6 points, 11.9 rebounds that season in the post. Um, he was, uh, and Willie White described him as uh, a funny guy with a drive which he could score when he needed to. Uh, he was 6'8", but he was skinny as a rail, and you can – definitely see that um anything stand out to you uh, for, about red robbins uh i mean yeah he is like real thin like you've never seen anyone that skinny he was like six eight and 200 pounds it was ridiculous yeah. uh, <laughs> uh but uh unfortunately i haven't been able to see a lot of game film of him uh but something that intrigued me was the fact that there's one year in utah it was 1972 where he shot 41 percent from the three-point line but he didn't take a lot of three. He took 73s that year, but made 41% of them. So clearly, like, that can just be, like, you know, small sample theater. But he was a, a, a front court player who did have outside range. Uh, yeah. Maybe not complete three-point range, uh, but he definitely a guy that would take, you know, 15 to 20-foot shots. And same thing goes for Zemo Beatty, too. He was another big man that could take those outside jumpers and uh, open up the lane. Yeah. And um, at that point, you know, there there weren't – the the guys who were who had sh- who were shooting a lot of threes during the season that that largely had passed in the ABA they, you know the three pointers were largely down so there weren't a lot of guys who were th- who were shooting a whole lot so seventy attempts in a season wasn't particularly like you know hugely low I mean it wasn't among the leaders but it wasn't like uh you know that was, was one game yeah yeah it's pretty much a you know three pointer a game and he was making forty one percent of them so right they had a trade where they they acquired um Ron Boone and uh, Glenn Combs for uh Donnie Freeman who had been uh who had been acquired for Matt Calvin who had you know led the team earlier Freeman was a, a very good player in the ABA but it didn't work out in Utah for whatever reason but they were able to get Boone and Combs who were both uh great uh, com- uh contributors to the uh, to their success especially Boone um Boone known as the little chief he was a uh 6'2 200 pound guard who um averaged uh, 15.8 points and 5.8 rebounds a game for the um for the stars and uh 
very athletic player, uh, great offensively, great scorer, very strong and quick, and uh, also known for being pretty fearless. Uh, you do things like attack uh, Ar- Artis Gilmore on drives to the uh, basket, <laughs> seven foot two Artis Gilmore, and uh, aggressively followed his sh- followed shots and put in uh, a lot of his own rebounds, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and known for just uh, being able to play every game. He he played. Uh, 1,041 games in a row between the uh, ABA and the NBA, which uh, was the record until um, AC Green broke it. But Boone played at least 20 minutes uh, in each game, apparently, which Green had his streak was propped up by, you know, uh, several oh, low minute performances. Yeah he, yeah, he had a couple of cameo appearances that, re- like, yeah, AC Green's Iron Man streak is kind of dubious in my book. Um, yeah, me personally, it's, it's Ron Boone, Randy Smith, and uh, Red Kerr. Those are the three Iron Man. AC Green, I just, I, I remember those games when he was with the Dallas Mavericks, and he would just come in for like two, three minutes, and then go sit back on the bench. But that's a digression. I just, I don't like AC Green holding that streak. But, there you uh, go. Well, we, yeah, that's personal we, animosity. We officially do not recognize the AC Green <laughs> record. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, over and backslash pro hoops history policy not to recognize that record. So. It has an asterisk next to it. All right, um, fair enough. But Ron Boone was definitely the Iron Man. I mean, you said he played 1,041 games straight. He played 1,041 games in his career. So basically, he didn't miss a game as far as he was concerned in his NBA and ABA career. Um, and you, you got it right. Like, he was a really small guard, uh, 6'2", but, or just a small player at 6'2", but he would play point guard, shooting guard, small forward, uh, just – bulldoze his way all over the court uh just like a little jumping jack this guy was just strong powerful like you see photos and he's, he's got these big stocky legs and just guy could jump out the gym um and once zelmo and willie wise had their injury problems and started to go on decline uh boone really took a bigger role on the team uh by you know by 75 he was averaging 25 points a game so uh, he was definitely someone that was able to pick up the slack as the other players were kind of declining in their years and uh, the other player, of course, Glenn Combs, who they acquired, was uh, uh, the first to average over 40% from three in a, a season, was known as uh, Jed among his teammates in the Kentucky Rifle around the league for his uh, sharp shooting from the uh, field. He, and, he, and he came up big in the uh, in the ABA Finals against Kentucky, had uh, 17 points or more in five of those uh, games. So w- w- at least in that series, was a, was a pretty standout uh uh, clutch performer. I don't know if there's anything else you have on uh, on Glenn Combs that stands out, but it was a, a good contributor to this team. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, he's the big thing with him with the three-point shooting or the outside shooting in general. Uh, you know, Red Robbins, we mentioned, you know, had a good percentage but only took one a game. Well, Combs had a good percentage and took three a game uh, for his career. So um, I, I, I just love recognizing the ABA players who are really good three-point shooters, you know, just so we kind of remember that, you know, 40, 45 years ago, there were guys taking lots of threes and make, making a good deal of them. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, as we today, we're like just mesmerized by the three-point shot, which, not going to lie, like it is being used at a higher degree. You know, Steph Curry taking like, you know, eight, nine three-pointers a game, but, you know, Glenn Combs back in, you know, 1970, 71 was taking four threes a game, so... Um, it's not as revolutionary as we think it is, I would say. Um, and Glenn Combs is one of those originators uh, that helped, you know, propel the three-point line back in the day. Sure, yeah, and it, and it had a similar effect in the ABA game as it has in yep. the, you know, the last ten years in the uh, in the NBA. So, um, opening things up and you know, and creating a more um, compelling style of play to a lot of people, um, and creating the same kind of controversy about that style of play that we uh, of have. Of course, today. yeah. So, yeah. Running the game. <laughs> yes. So uh, they beat uh, uh, the Chef again in the West semis uh, who had Donnie Freeman of course would have been traded there and the infamous uh, Le- Laverne Jelly Tart uh, <laughs> delicious yes, Jelly Tart yes, yeah. je- delicious as well and um, and then they they avenged their previous year's finals loss against the uh, Pacers in a, uh, a seven game series um, obviously four games three uh, and one thing that was uh, that, that Zemo brought was a really an ability to uh, frustrate uh, Mel Daniels, the uh, Indiana big man who was uh, you know tore through the league, won two MVPs, but uh, but Zemo gave him a lot of trouble with uh, sort of his uh, I guess you could say his veteran tricks. Yeah, Zemo liked the <laughs> yeah he uh, I already mentioned the elbows. Uh, he would also squeeze the hip, stomp on the foot. Uh, just little subtle things to annoy the other centers. Uh, 
Mel Daniels was pretty short too. I think he was also six nine. But um, when he when Zemo played in the NBA, I already mentioned like he would get on Will Chamberlain's nerves. Uh, Nate Thurman, anybody else who was taller than him, he had the little tricks to annoy him. Uh, so that was a different uh, aspect that the Utah Stars had at that point that, that no other ABA team had was that they did have another just not just good but all-star MVP quality center in Zemo Beatty to go up against Mel Daniels, uh, which is something the Pacers really didn't have to, to fear mostly up until that point. And there, there were a lot of interesting individual matchups in this series. I mean, um, uh, Brown versus Wise, um, and, of course, Daniels versus Beatty. And, you know, th- these were really two very um, classically matched up teams in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you mentioned earlier, like, they met five years in a row in the playoffs. And, you know, in 70, Pacers win the title. 71, the Stars win the title. Then in 72 and 73, the Pacers win the title. So four years in a row between those two teams, you know, the team that beat the other one is the one that won the ABA championship. And they... Uh, I think they went to seven games every single one of those years. Well, except the uh, – no, two of them they went to seven games, and then two of them they went to six games. So they were a really hard-fought contest. Uh, so those those were definitely the, you know, the premier teams in the ABA during that four-year stretch, 70, uh, 70 to 73, I guess you should say. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, matchups up and down the roster because, uh, you know – the Stars ended up adding Jimmy Jones later on, and then the Pacers ended up adding George McGinnis later on. So even as some of their – previous players kind of fell off they were able to add these all-star players to replace them so Mm -hmm. uh, it it was quite the rivalry the uh the stars actually went up 3-1 in this um in this series and then um the um uh billy keller had seven three-pointers in game six to uh help uh the pacers beat the uh beat the stars in utah in game six the uh indiana or excuse me uh, yeah yeah help the pacers win um a close game 105 102 in uh, utah game five had been a blowout by the uh, pacers so uh down to game seven and um on the road yes on the road in indiana and uh Basically, one thing that that turned uh, the uh, game is that uh, Bill Sharman at halftime, trying to figure out what they could do differently, they decided to put the ball in Willie Wise's hands, make Roger Brown play some defense, which he was not uh, strongly known for, and um, and that's, and, a nice, that's very that's a very judicious way to phrase it. No, yes. good. So. <laughs> And Wise ended up scoring 31 points in the game. Uh, Robbins had 25, and, uh, and and six of the stars had double figures to lead to a 108-101 win in that series. It was a hard-fought one. They got it on the road. Um, and then, of course, they had to really got it. Uh, I was watching, a, watching his interview with Willie Wise. He was like, oh, we had just beat the Pacers, so we knew we were going to get to the title. And, yeah, we had to play another team that wasn't really the title. But we had, we had the ABA title on our hands. And it's like you did go seven games against the Kentucky Colonels in the next round. So Yes. Uh, so yeah, so the Colonels weren't as good as the Pacers, but they still took them to seven games. So that wasn't an easy series either. Yes, and that's uh, – Dan Issel uh, had, was there by then. Of course, Daryl Carrier and Louis Dampier were their you know, famous backcourt, yep. shooting a lot of threes. Uh, Cincinnati's Powell as well was uh, famously there. Um Utah did win its home games pretty easily, but the uh, the road games they lost were all close by an average of four, including an overtime loss in uh, game four, uh, 129 to 125. Um, but they were able to get game seven at home in uh, this series and um, won uh, one game seven, 131 to uh, 121. Um, uh, game seven had... Um, Issel scored 41 in that game, but Beatty had 36 points with on 15 of 24 shooting with 16 rebounds. And Willie Wise had 22 and 20. Combs had 20 and 19. So all of those uh, guys really uh, came through. And um, the the fans rushed the court after the uh, after the victory. And um, uh, the ecstatic fans rushed the uh, crowd to show their appreciation and um they hoisted uh wise yeah. and Beatty on their shoulders and whisked them away uh and, which is quite the feat to hoist Zemo Beatty on your shoulders and walk them off the court yes That's... exactly <laughs> yeah six nine 260 250 pounds those are some strong fans out there yeah <laughs> you know uh they I, I guess they they, they build them big in uh, Utah so oh yeah um 
So, uh, Beatty was the ABA playoff team, and this clearly the uh, peak of the uh, Stars' uh, accomplishments in the uh, at the time. Although they would, you know, continue to have a strong team in uh, in seventy two, they'd actually have a better regular season record, record win sixty games, uh, second in the league, second in the league in, in SRS. But they would run into the Pacers again in the uh, Western Division Finals, and uh, the, the the Pacers had added George McGinnis that year, who would um, he obviously lead the team in it in the second. Uh, half of its kind of its run on the top of the you know the 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 core of Mel Daniels, Freddie Brown, or um, uh, Roger Brown, Freddie Lewis. Those guys are all uh, going strong. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, Stars and the Bucks actually both the champions of the leagues actually played an exhibition game in uh, the Assault Palace in uh, in October of seventy one, which was dubbed the Super Bowl of Basketball. It was a close game most of the way, but eventually the Bucks uh, won that game. And I, I assume that's the first time that the two champions met, you know, in, in the season afterward. I, I hadn't, I don't think that would have happened before. Uh, I yeah, I don't know for sure either, but. I know by uh, the first few years of the NBA ABA rivalry, the NBA would just refuse to play any exhibition games. So uh, by '71, I think there were exhibition games that are finally starting to happen. So uh, that again, don't know for sure, but I would think that would be the first time that you know the NBA and ABA champ had met an exhibition game. Mm-hmm. Um, and they added Jimmy Jones that season, who was you know a, a, a core piece for that team for the uh, for the next couple of years. Um, uh, what can you tell us about Jimmy Jones? Oh, he's scorer first and foremost. Uh, the guy had a smooth jump shot. Uh, you still look when you listen to uh, Hubie, Hubie Brown on his broadcasts, uh, even still today, and he talks about James Jones. He still calls him Jimmy Jones. Like, oh, Jimmy Jones has got this jump shot. And I'm like, I think Hubie Brown is secretly thinking back to the ABA and Jimmy Jones, like the real Jimmy Jones back then. Because uh, Jimmy would put up, you know, 17 to 20 points a game and hit 50% of his shots. Uh, the guy was a supremely efficient scoring guard uh, and point guard at that. So imagine your point guard going out there and hitting 50% of his shots. Uh, so that and this is the thing with Utah. They had just this this bevy of like just kind of undersized players that would play bigger than their size. They'd all get these rebounds and just take it to the basket and make these high percentage shots. And Zelmo was really the only big man out there, uh, so to speak. So, um, so I think as, as he kind of, his knees bit the dust, I think that's what kind of undermined the team uh, most of all until of course they're a super signing that we'll get to later on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Jimmy Jones, really good guard. Another guy that just plugged in who could score a lot of, or not a lot of points, but, was able to score a lot of points on a really good percentage. Um, we seem to be the calling card of all their guards over the years. And um, I also should have mentioned that uh, Bill Sharman this season, he went to the Lakers yep. after the championship season. Um, Liddell Anderson was his replacement. He was a longtime college coach in uh, in Utah, Utah State, and later BYU. Uh, very much an advocate of the run-and-gun style of uh, basketball. Uh, not that Sharman didn't like to um, go up and down the floor as well. He, he was His teams were known for um, fast-breaking as well, so I don't know how much of a stylistic change it was to, to an extent. But obviously, Anderson was no Bill Sharman. Harmon, but he did seem to the, the, the team seemed to run pretty smoothly under him as well. I don't know much about him specifically, but they, you know uh, they, they didn't win a championship, but they did come fairly close. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, seventy three, they uh, they swap out uh, Red, lose Red Robbins. They add Gerald Govan. Fifty five wins, which is third in the league, and they're second in the uh, league in SRS. They actually beat uh, San Diego Qs uh, in the West Semis, who had Red Robbins. Uh, and then lose to the Pacers again, uh, four games to uh, two uh, in the Western Division Finals. So, so running to the Pacers again, who win the championship again as well, uh, winning the back-to-back championships. The one of the, the GM, whoever the GM was for the Stars at that point, um, he admitted because they like you just mentioned the San Diego Qs getting Red Robins. Uh, the GM of the Stars admitted like, yeah, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have let Red Robins get away because that kind of undermined the front court and. Definitely by that point, their front court, you know, the two main players were, you know, actual big men were Zemo Beatty and uh, Cincy Powell. So, and those, both of those guys were on the wrong side of the 30, or getting to the wrong side of 30 at that point. So, um, and then Gerald Govan, too, another, like, uh, the other big guy, wrong side of 30. So, Red Robins, someone they could ill afford to lose at the time they lost them. So, I think that showed. Mm-hmm. Well, they slipped a bit in their record the next season, 74, 51 and 33, which is third in the league. But their SRS was uh, sixth out of 11 teams in uh, 
that season. But the, despite that, they were able to make a uh, run to the finals. Uh, that year, they were coached by uh, Joe Mullaney, who had coached the uh, Lakers in the early 70s, but before Bill Sharman, and also coached uh, a, a few uh, ABA teams. Kind of, He got around uh, in the uh, 70s to a lot of different teams. And um, Zelmo, this was, his play was declining clearly at this point. He had nine surgeries in his career and then got into a dispute with the Stars front office and sat out for training camp in the start of the regular season. There was a, a lawsuit. Uh, he actually, su- they both sued each other and um, and Zelmo clearly frustrated by the situation said basketball was a rotten business. They figure once they've drained you all, you're worth and they just dumped you. And um, and he was upset by the situation, obviously. They, they did resolve it and he did play, but uh, he uh, left the team after the uh, 74 season, went back to the um, NBA, and uh, actually joined up with Bill Sharman with the uh, Lakers. Yeah, and that was the beginning of the end of the Stars. Um, so in 74, yeah, 74, they lost in the finals um, to the New York Nets and uh, Julius Irving. So uh, they really had no chance of winning that series. The Nets that year were just, they were a buzzsaw. Um, you know, they had Dr. J, Larry Keenan, John Williamson, Billy Paltz. So that team was stacked. And the Stars were just like playing on house money when they got to the finals that year. Um and yeah, the, like uh, Willie Wise also spoke about how the Stars management was seemed to be getting um, oh, what's the right word here? I guess just they were just weren't as nice as they used to be, basically. Uh, so Zemo's quote that you put out there that seemed to indicate the change in attitude of the management. Uh, and Willie Wise, you know, once Zemo Beatty left, Willie Wise said like he didn't feel like a family anymore. Didn't feel like we had the same camaraderie as before. And then he ended up getting traded to the Virginia Squires, I believe. Uh, so very soon after Zemo left for the NBA. So uh, things came quickly tumbling down for the Stars after the 74 season. Yeah, and um, 75, definitely a rebuilding year for the team. The highlight was uh, drafting Moses Malone out of high school, uh, wooing him away from the uh, University of Maryland and other suitors that had tried to um, tried to get him to uh, go to college, but he decided to uh, go to the pros. We talked a lot about that situation on our uh, podcast, talking about breaks of the game, where it's, uh, where it's talked about a lot uh, there, but... Uh, they were able to have um, able to get the first season uh, or so out of uh, Moses and establish him establish his first home in the league. Although it wasn't much of a season for the franchise. I mean, yeah, no. Again, by this point, the franchise was you know limping along, and Moses had a great rookie year. Uh, Ron Boone, who I mentioned earlier, this was the year he averaged twenty five points a game, so he was he was still going well, but everything else was just. Coming apart at the seams, basically, for the franchise. And in the next season, it all just completely bit the dust. Um, and they didn't even last the whole year. They just quickly fell apart um, in 1976. Yeah, uh, 16 games in the season, they uh, completely um, uh, yeah, they, they uh, dissolved. The, the team dissolved. And there's a story of, like, an injured uh, Moses Malone. And, you know, because basically <laughs> the, the, yep. the, the guys were all invited to just take whatever they wanted out of the uh, office because, you know, they, they couldn't pay them at this point. Um uh, the owner, Bill Daniels, was running for the governor of state of, of Colorado and had been uh, nearly bankrupted and uh, basically, um, you know, for uh, that, among other factors, I'm sure, forcing the team to uh, shut down. I imagine the the success they had at the gate at that point with a not successful team wasn't as good. So and they were one of four ABA teams to collapse that year. So obviously the league was in trouble and the, the merger would happen in the uh, uh, the next offseason. Um Apparently, though, he did later pay back his uh, creditors at interest. Um, so at least he was able to uh, uh, – Daniels was able to come back from that situation and uh, and pay what he owed, which is a lot more than a lot of people would have done I would in that situation. Yeah. It's more than certain presidential candidates would do. Yes, that as well. That as well. So um, <laughs> anything else that stands out about the Stars for you before we go? Um, I, th- I think we got it all. It's um... – Check, check my notes here, make sure I didn't miss nothing. But, uh, yeah, no, we got it all. Uh, yeah. We got Ron Boone, got Willie Wise, Bill Sharman. Yeah. Uh, one cool thing about Bill Sharman, like uh, 70, 71, 72, and 73, uh, he made uh, finals every single one of those years, won two championships, and won back-to-back coach of the years in the NBA and ABA. So uh, Bill Sharman was at the top of his coaching game in that little stretch. Um and so, yeah, I think that was kind of the, although he did that between the NBA and ABA, but I think that 70 to 73, 74 stretch was the, was the golden era of Utah basketball uh, for all concerned until, you know, two decades later when the Utah Jazz uh, really become a, 
a real force in the NBA. So uh, basketball fans, the pro basketball fans in Utah, the early 70s, late 90s, I think those are the two golden periods of uh, what they should consider the two golden periods of their uh, state's basketball history. Yes, and uh, and obviously I think the success in um – the success in the early '70s you demonstrated that uh, you know Salt Lake was a viable option for the NBA yep. when they decided to move the Jazz there, and uh, Ron Boone is still doing commentary for the uh, Jazz, so is is sort of keeps that spirit uh, of of the uh, of the original uh, franchise in Utah alive through uh, you know his yeah. commentary there. Yep, and he also he uh, last little thing I guess is that he also played for the Utah Jazz. Uh, right. That was the very last team to play for in the NBA. So that's. Uh, Ron Boone's the man connecting it all. You know, member of the 71 championship team with the Stars, played in the, I think it was the very first season that the Jazz were in Utah. He played for them. Yes. So uh, he was able to connect the two different eras of the pro basketball there in the state. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's, and as you said, it's still calling games for the Jazz. So uh, he's been around a long time in Utah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Curtis, uh, thank you for, so much for uh, joining the show. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, checking us out. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Over and Back NBA. You can find our podcast at uh, HardwoodParoxysm.com. And uh, if you uh, if you listen to us through iTunes or Stitcher or whatever podcast service you use, uh, please leave us a rating and review. It lets people know that uh, you like us and leads to more popularity for us, which make, which satisfies our egos and makes us very happy. So uh, until next time, thanks for listening. We'll be back again soon. Next time on Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s. About how you know, he's trying to negotiate a contract with Charlie Finley, and then he's going in. Uh, you know, they're supposed to have lunch together, and he's going in, and like Charlie Finley's like heating up the soup and is like this hot plate, and he's like, oh, you know, he must not have you know have very much with you know if, if he's having to deal with this. So he ended up accepting a lesser amount. Finding out later that was just sort of a trick that Finley liked to do to you know, <laughs> not not pay him. You know.